Then isn't that, though, the only way she has an op judging from the evidence that we've been privy to? And to your point, the prosecutor, Ed Bull, who is a bull in the courtroom, he was a bit chintzy in the information. They have more. I mean, let's face it. They found um, her clothes in the washing machine, just one set of clothes uh, right. as they knocked on the door there. So don't you have to almost put her on the stand? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, again, if it was me, I would be working the prosecutor for some kind of deal to preserve some portion of her life. You know, she's looking at life with no parole in that particular state. Um, I, you know, I, she strikes me based on the clip you just played and, and her behavior leading up to this incident that she is going to do what she wants to do. So, you know, usually, although it's the defendant's choice, they usually do rely on us for that ultimate question, should I go on the stand or should I not go on the stand? But in this case, Ted, it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, six months from now or eight months from now, we're in a situation where, um, you know, some attorney, whether it's the gentleman um, who represents her now or somebody else, goes on the record, you know, at the end of proofs and says, I've advised her not to do this, but she insists on testifying and she has that right. So I think this is one of those cases where the lawyer is not going to have control. Yeah. And you can see that in that Zoom hearing. We also um, know that she has filed, uh, she wrote that letter to the judge saying that she's right. frustrated with her representation, which brings back you know, brings to mind other defendants who are battling with their attorneys. Uh, a lot of them end up on the stand because they want to be heard and they, they right. want to take control of their own defense. And, and she appears to possibly be going in that direction. We don't know. And, of course, maybe she doesn't even know at this yeah. point. How do you deal with, right. a, with a client that doesn't want to really hear from you in terms of your advice, even though you're giving them sound advice? You know, I, I always try to be candid and brutally honest with clients right off jump. Um, you know, start out with the worst case scenario as opposed to painting some rosy pictures. You know, it's very common that when you first see a client incarcerated, whether it's a murder case or, or some other case, you know, they've already got an idea of what the defense is going to look like. And I try to break that down to its foundation right off the bat. And if they don't like it, that's fine. Um, they can get another lawyer. But you have to take control right away. And then ultimately, hopefully, there's some level of trust that um, can be established. You know, I always tell clients, you know, put yourself in a time machine. And if you are willing to accept a result that ends up in a guilty verdict and you made your own decisions or you did things your own way, and at the end of the day, you're going to say, oh, it's my fault, it's on me, then that decision is sound. It might not be legally sound, but it's, you know, if that's what you want to do, you want to testify, good by you. If when the jury comes back, you're in the, if you're in the time machine and you can see yourself with the jury coming back saying, I wish I would have done what Mr. White advised, then you need to do what I advise. Um, you know, and I think when people can, for, you know, look into the future and, and think about it in those terms, as opposed to the acute situation. I've got to get out of jail. I've got to get to my kids. I've got to get to work. But really think about the long-term consequences of their choices. Um, they often make the right choice. Yeah. Well, I wish I had one of those time machines that could go back. Yeah. And, um, the, talk jury selection. There's a, a fairgrounds, basically, is where they're having this jury selection, a large um, a place outside the courthouse so that they can bring in 100-plus people. The prosecution argued, we don't want these potential jurors wearing face masks. We want them in shields because this is general voir dire. We want to be able to see other people's reactions to questions we're asking, maybe juror number 62. We want to see if juror 43 rolls their eyes, hers or hers. What's your take on the importance of being able to see the faces of potential jurors and in the courtroom seeing the defendant seeing witnesses, the masks can prevent that. I 100% agree with the prosecuting attorney in, the, in this regard. Um, I've, you know, there, there, the idea of running a trial during COVID for me was something that I avoided like the plague, um, civil trials included. Um, the importance of building rapport with a jury for both sides is critical. It's, 
you know, anybody that's ever conducted a jury that's lasted more than a few days, you know, you never forget those people. You know, I've conducted more than 50 trials and I see people all over our state who are in our juries and I, I remember them right away, you know, as opposed to maybe friends from college that I spent a lot of time with. There's just something about that experience. There's a bonding between the parties, especially in serious matters. And to have the face or partial face um, not exposed you just diminishes that ability to create that relationship. And, and I agree with the prosecutor. I think we're going to see some appeals forthcoming that, you know, obviously we wanted to keep people safe. But I think one of the consequences of COVID is going to be an examination of how court's been conducted over the course of the last 13 months. And in particular, um, as we get into jury trials now, how those juries are dealt with? Are they dealt with in some non-traditional fashion that arguably created prejudice to one or both sides? Um, so I agree with the prosecutor on this one. Yeah.